Good evening, everybody, and um, thank you for joining us uh, again this evening. I say again because I suspect that many of you have joined us previously on, uh, on other of our uh, evening presentations. This is an unusual one because it's on a Wednesday, and they're normally on a Tuesday and a Thursday. And it's also slightly unusual because we're a little bit later um, than normal, largely on account of the fact that I think that was, Alex was putting the kids to bed. Is that right, Alex? Were you putting uh, that's that's right, Chris. Yes. Good evening, that's everybody. <laughs> Good stuff. Um, so, um, as with our previous talks and presentations, there'll be plenty of opportunity to ask questions. Um, for those of you that are unfamiliar with the Zoom webinar facility um, or Zoom webinar system. Um, you'll see at the bottom of your screen two or three icons, one of which is a chat icon. You're very welcome to post questions on chat. Um, the other is Q&A, and you're very welcome to post questions on Q&A. Um, you'll also see something which is called polling, um, and that will enable me to pose a question to you all, um, which I will do once Alex has finished his his presentation. So I'll pose a question to everybody. Um, that will be obviously at the end of the presentation. Um, but in the meantime, um, I am obviously delighted to welcome Alex to, um, to our Zoom webinar this evening. And um, by way of introduction, Alex and I um, have done one or two trips together. Alex uh, and myself and Nick Garbutt, in fact, um, who many of you will know. Um, and Alex and Nick um, lead a number of trips together. Uh, Alex is an extraordinarily talented photographer and uh, is um, a fabulous teacher. I know that's something that Alex very much enjoys. Um, Alex's wonderful images have won a number of awards over the years. And I know that um, you are in for a feast in terms of um, Alex's presentation. Uh, having seen one or two presentations of Alex's in the past um, and had the pleasure of working with Alex um, in uh, South Georgia and elsewhere, if I'm not mistaken, Borneo, that was the other place I was trying mm -hmm. to think of. Um, but uh, I am uh, sure that it will be a, a photographic feast and I know that Alex will be delighted to ask any questions. So please don't hold back. Please do feel free to post questions on Q&A and chat. And um, Alex and I will have a chat um, at the end um, uh, during the course of which I will throw a few questions at him. And uh, no doubt Alex will throw a few answers back. What do you think, Alex? Sound like a good idea? That's how it works, Chris. Um, I must say, I, I don't know at the moment. Can people actually see me or can they? Yeah, they see? can see you. They can. They can oh, that's you. interesting. It's always worth knowing that. It's always worth checking. Hey, there was yeah, one Yeah, better other... know about that um, before we get there going. There was one other thing I was just going to, to, to say to people because um, I have had in the past, it's a technical thing, but I have had in the past one or two people sending messages to say that, to say that the main image isn't big enough. So for those of you that um, are unfamiliar with uh, the Zoom webinar system, if you look um, to the right of the main image, about halfway down, you'll see two little lines. And you can, you can actually click on those two little, two little lines and drag them to the right, which will then make the main image bigger. Um, so there we go, Alex, unless... Um, you think I might have missed anything out, which with any luck I haven't, um, then I'm going to leave it to you. I'm going to hide and let you do your stuff. Oh, uh, well, th thanks very much, Chris, and uh, kind words from you. Um, not uncharacteristic. You're a always kind trying. man, as we all know. Um, good evening, everybody. It's very nice to be doing something, um, something with lots of other people. I've been working in relative isolation for too long now. In a normal year, I'm a tour leader, but there hasn't been much of that going on as late, as we all know. Um, I, I work as a freelance natural history photographer. And this evening, I'm going to try and show you a broad selection of my work, some stuff that I shot 
just the other day, some, some stuff that's from the archives. Um, the idea is to share the techniques behind these images with you. Don't worry if you're new to photography. Uh, I'll try and make this accessible to everyone. I know some of you will be very skilled up with your macro photography already. Um, but if, if photography is not so much your thing, hopefully you'll still enjoy seeing all of the animals. Um, here's my kit bag from a few years ago, plonked unceremoniously on the rainforest floor in Costa Rica. Um, it does end up a bit of a state after a few days, but I thought I'd just mention that when I go out into the forest, say, despite the fact I'm photographing very small things a lot of the time, I seem to have more equipment than people photographing larger animals. My bag always seems to weigh more, uh, but I am a big advocate of bringing lots of lenses. Uh, they're your creative eyes onto the world and all those different focal lengths and extension tubes and everything really make the difference. So yeah, in a normal year, I'd like to be meeting creatures like this lima leaf frog. Um, however, on Monday, I was to be seen in my garden. And you know it's, you know it's bad when you have to resort to winter bud photography. So this is um, the bud of a beech tree that I'm just having a go at focus stacking in my back garden. Nice blue sky. But there you go. It, it just doesn't quite get me as excited as uh, a lima leaf frog, if I'm honest. But because I produce stock photography, it's actually quite a useful image. Funnily enough, not that many other people have thought to photograph this fascinating subject. But there was a little bit more to this um, project in that I collect antique microscope slides. And this next image is a cross section of this bud. So you can see all of these wonderful details, all of this life waiting to erupt out of this tiny little bud. Uh, we've got wiggly red lines, which represent all of the leaves compressed in there. At the top, you can see pollen grains in the flowers that are going to emerge. So me being me, I like shooting white background stuff. I did the bud on a white background, a little montage. And this is the sort of image that I would send off to my agency. And it, it's, um, you know, obviously takes a little bit of planning, um, but the photography itself is very easy, very methodical. It's the idea behind the picture that obviously takes the time. I'm not going to go down the path of talking about microscopy this evening. It's a whole separate topic, but needless to say, my microscope has been keeping me very happy and entertained during lockdown. Um, there's a whole world to explore. And I mean, this composition here, um, is about two millimetres in real life. However, coming back to the much larger world of butterflies, uh, we find ourselves in April, and I don't know if any of you have been lucky enough to see one of these yet, not a, a bluebell, but a, an orange tip butterfly. I saw my first one on the last day of March. And in the hedgerow right now, these little entities will be waiting to emerge. So much like the beech bud we looked at, there are chrysalis containing butterflies waiting to erupt any moment. And I do hope they dodge the snow that we had today. But you can see this is an orange tip butterfly. There's a flash of orange there on the wing. And here's the egg of the orange tip butterfly. So we're going in very close here and um, I actually photographed this one in my dining room. It was very easy to do. Each year I collect some eggs and I rear them and it lets me follow the life cycle. And that little lens that's flashed up there is the Canon MPE 65. That is the way to get these really, really close images if you're a Canon shooter. But I'm going to go into detail about how we can get in super close like this. If you're new to spotting orange tip butterflies and their eggs in the field, you're looking for these little orange eggs, usually laid singularly on their food plants, which are garlic mustard and cuckoo flower. We've got lots of garlic mustard in the lanes around where we live. And throughout April, I'll enjoy spotting these little orange eggs uh, on the seed pods usually. Of course, once you get 
very close in on a butterfly, there's a whole sort of secondary layer to the compositions that are possible. So this is another orange tip butterfly. Um, you can see that glow from the orange on the underside of the wing there coming through. And I focus stack this image. Um, that's a technique I will tell you a little bit more about as the evening progresses. Here's a little overview of the lenses I commonly have in my bag. Um, so the 100 mil macro bottom left is the one that I use, I'd say most of the time. If you're without a macro lens at the moment and you'd like to try some close up photography, I really recommend bottom right, some extension tubes. You put them between your camera lens and um, the camera body and it basically just moves the minimum focusing distance a bit closer to the lens. So it lets you get closer to your subjects and they're quite affordable. You can pick up a, a stack of three of those for, I don't know, about 90 quid or something. And it'll give you lots of magnification on lenses such as telephoto lenses. Um, you can even put very short extension tubes on wide angle lenses and have a bit of fun with that too, getting closer. <laughs> the non-lens element of my bag, well, lots of flash equipment. Um, flash is really useful for lighting small, fast moving subjects. Uh, the flash can freeze the action. So if you've got an insect walking around, how dare it? And you want to take a photo, if you light the picture with a burst of flash, it will freeze that action and you can get a nice sharp image. And I really wish somebody had explained that to me when I started macro photography all those years ago. And the penny drops that you could uh, use flash in that way, it really changed my photography. This is a scene that I spotted locally and I think it was January, uh, scarlet elf cup fungus. And it's a rather bizarre situation. Um, there's a river near us that had flooded the surrounding countryside and all of the logs that usually have this fungus growing on every year in the same place had floated. So it's given me a chance to get a sky reflected where there would normally be leaf litter and soil. Uh, just adding a little bit of colour to that scene. Now I put this one in because it's done with a fisheye lens. You can see that the trunks of the trees are slightly curved at the edge. That's a giveaway sign. But you can use a fisheye lens to do very effective close up photography. The minimum focusing distance on a fisheye lens is, you know, really quite short. So it gives you a great opportunity there. And uh, my good friend and fellow photographer, Nick Garbert, loves fisheye photography. Um, he does have a habit of photographing people with them, which I, I think is slightly questionable. Um, it does distort the face somewhat, but uh, certainly in terms of fungus, it's a, a sound choice if you ask me. This action shot, if you can <laughs> talk about action photography and fungus in the same sentence, is of a puffball. And about half a second before this frame was released, you'd have seen somebody's finger in the frame, just giving that puffball a little flick to eject its spores into the air. We actually shot this at um, a workshop in Agas in the Cairngorms on a wildlife worldwide trip last autumn. Um, it was a very rainy day and we all gathered around to try our luck with this uh, mid-air spore photography. It was really good fun. So we've We've got a couple of flash guns there to backlight that scene. But when I got back, I thought I'd really like to try and do this in the field and show, instead of a black background, have a, have a bit of woodland context to it. So I managed to get this shot. Um, it took a, a long while to capture. It's not, it's not gonna win wildlife photographer of the year, but for me, it's a useful storytelling piece because you can really see where these puffballs are growing here. That context is very interesting to me and we can still see the spores. And here's a little iPhone shot showing you a couple of flash guns with diffusers on pointing in at those puff balls. Um, and it's all about tweaking those angles and positions of those flash guns to get the backlighting just right. Here's some very simple bread and butter ideas for if you if you want to do close up photography, uh, 
often it's quite dark down on the ground makes sense so i use foil reflectors a great deal so here's the shot as i saw it originally and now i'm going to put a gold reflector underneath and now i'm going to put a silver reflector underneath and you can see the light quality has changed again i prefer if i go back the gold one if we go back to square one nothing it's not that it's a bad picture but here we can see a lot more detail if you want a gold and silver reflector well um, you can get them from salmon packs um, i tend to use tetra bricks so orange juice cartons have all sorts of different colored foil in them but just something to shine the light back into the subject this is a slime mold so not technically a fungus um, that I also photographed um, up in Agas last year and what I've done here is try to include once again as much environment around this tiny little subject and I'm going to show you in the next frame how close the camera was to that do you see those little orange dots right in front of the lens that's the slime mold and if I hop back you can see that was the perspective we, we gained from getting that close. This is a very specialist lens. It's a macro lens, but it's a 15 millimeter macro lens. So that means it gives a very wide angle view uh, to include all of that habitat. It also gets very dark on your subject when you get that close. You'll see a macro focusing rail here. So attaching the camera to the tripod is this rail with a worm gear on it and that allows me to move the camera backwards and forwards quite precisely for this sort of work. I'm using live view on the back of the camera zoomed into 10 times to check the critical focus of that slime mold before taking a picture. Um, that's, that's a really good way of making sure everything's sharp. Now this is a special picture for Tony my good friend Tony, who communicated to me via Instagram, which I must say I'm still getting to grips with. I think I did my fifth post on it uh, yesterday to try and promote this talk. And Tony asked me, could you put in something about springtails? Because I've been trying to photograph them in the garden during lockdown. And um, yeah, they're, they're tiny little things. You know, they're about the size of a full stop. Uh, they've got these what look like hairs coming off them. These are actually waxy projections. And I mean, firstly, I, I'd say, Tony, try and find springtails that are on contrasting backgrounds. So this is on a decaying bit of dark wood. Then it matters less if the subject's a little bit small in the frame. It will contrast nicely and show up. I've backlit this one with a single flash. In terms of where to find them, the best way to find springtails is to leave some large leaves on your lawn, if you're lucky enough to have one, or anywhere in a garden. Um, and just go out in the morning and turn those leaves over and decaying leaves seem to really attract springtails, particularly in the winter. This is a springtail on a decaying leaf um, that I'm actually holding in my hand whilst moving backwards and forwards with the camera to try and get it in focus. It does help if you're photographing a springtail on a leaf because you don't have to get down on the deck to do it you can just bring the leaf up to the level of the camera and it'll happily run around on there. And if you ever go to the coast, have a look in rock pools because these are a special species of coastal springtail that form these large aggregations. This is floating on top of a rock pool and they'll uh, be feeding on seaweed and debris uh, at low tide. And they just form these lovely little discs of, of life floating around. There's some sand grains there top left to give you a sense of scale. So there's three springtail pictures. I hope that helps. Um, I do tend to go in beyond one-to-one -one life size. Um, so beyond the standard macro magnification for these, a few extension tubes on a normal macro lens will do the job. Oh, just hop forwards again. This is a, a character I met um, quite recently, you know, during the winter when things were looking a little sparse outside for my photography I, I did what I always do I turned over a few rocks and I found this bristle tail which is probably about a centimeter in length and you can see all these beautiful little scales on it and I focus stack this image um, so 
I took about six photos, gradually moving through the depth of the subject. And then I stitched them all together to produce this image that shows us all this detail in these lovely scales that it almost looks like it's got a center parting there, doesn't it? Um, and I always think when I'm teaching people that, you know, focus stacking comes up an awful lot. It, it gives amazing results. And the thing is, it's actually really easy. Um, once you know how, but it's a stumbling block for so many of us. Um, it's just about tying down your technique, making sure you keep the exposure exactly the same frame to frame, that you get on and do the focus stack in a very short space of time. So you're not allowing the subject time to move um, in between shots or the images will not stitch together. Um, and, you know, some cameras will even do focus stacking in camera these days. And <laughs> I must say, when, when somebody's really struggling um, to get their head around this in the field, of course, I'm terribly polite, but I have to, so I'll just hop onto that one in a minute. I have to remind myself that, you know, it takes people maybe a few practices to, to get good at this, um, this concept. It's a bit beyond what we, we used to do with film photography, for instance. It's really embracing digital photography for what it is. Earthbound. So this is one of the projects I've been working on throughout lockdown um, with two other wonderful artists, Kate Bellis and Sally Matthews, um, one a photographer, one a sculptor. And we're looking at connections people and creatures have with the soil under our feet. And it's been really interesting for the last year. It's a two year project. Uh, my role in this has been to photograph all the little things that help tell this story. Uh, these are pollen grains on the anthers of a small scabious focus stacked. Um, here's some fungus infiltrating some leaf litter. And here's one of my little helpers. Um, actually, focus stacking is so easy that a three year old can do it. So please uh, be reassured. You will get there if you want to learn it. She she really can do focus stacking now. Um, there she is moving the camera forwards with the focusing rail. I mean, I'm hoping that in a few years I'll just take her out to the field and I'll just, you know, sit in a deck chair and she'll do all the photography for me. That would be very convenient indeed. In case you need any convincing, here's another focus stack image. It's, uh, it's the technique for me, I'll tell you. It's a, a stinging nettle up close. Such an ordinary subject, but really brought to life once you see all of these little details, all those stinging hairs there. Now, I don't see the point in these talks of, you know, reeling off my greatest hits from the last 15 years of time in the field. I, I mean, it's lovely to see pretty pictures, but you tend to learn less from them than maybe the ones that have gone a bit wrong. And I'm just like anyone, when I arrive at a subject, I kind of just start taking pictures and they're usually not very good to begin with and here's a very honest bad picture of a spider I took in autumn last year and I mean it's in focus but oh my goodness it just bores me to death um, lots far too much space around the subject and it doesn't contrast with its background and I think this is the most important thing I can really um, stress tonight it's that there are thousands of little subjects out there when you go for a walk, but only a few that you'll find that have a suitable contrasting background to really show off all their fine features. So I tried dropping the camera angle down a bit with this spider. And so same spider, now it's against the sky and it's improved things, but it's still very ordinary. And even if I was to get in much closer, as I'm sure you all would eventually, you'd want to maybe lose the vegetation left and right we'd still have a rather straightforward image. What was amazing was I, I came around the other side of the spider after this, and there was the dark wall of a quarry there, um, completely in the shade. And so the sun was just peeping over the top of that, catching the silk and causing a great pattern of refraction in the silk threads. And it looked like this. So just by using what was there, having a think about it, trying to find some contrast. Uh, we've created a much more interesting and engaging image. Probably not so good for a, an identification guide. That would be the second image I showed you, but 
um, for me, this is what the photography is all about. It's about exploring all these creative ideas, sketching with the camera in the field, if you like, to develop a composition as you go. And just to give you an idea, the sun was just out of frame at the top. And if I go to the next frame, you can see this is what happens if you just tilt the camera in the wrong direction a tiny bit, you know, a couple of degrees movement and it's ruined. Just tilt it down and you've cut the sun out of the frame and you've got this refraction effect nice and clear. As part of the Earthbound project, I've <laughs> photographed some interesting subjects. Um, somebody gave me a dead barn owl, which was very interesting. Um, this is a focus stack of its talons. And um, to tell the story of the nutrient cycle there, uh, we visited the barn, saw the little bones on the barn floor from the decomposed owl pellets. And I picked out this little shrew mandible. And you'll see it's got bright red teeth from the iron deposits in the enamel there. I thought that was really interesting. Popped it on a little rig that I have at home where I can move my camera very carefully with a stereo microscope stand and got this image showing beautiful detail in this shrew's mandible. Just look at that red enamel there. So the iron actually makes the enamel stronger on the biting surfaces. Another project I've been working on um, over the last couple of years is Back from the Brink. It's a, been a really exciting project, photographing lots of tiny overlooked creatures that are in danger of going extinct in England. And we're just trying to raise their profile. So this was a tiny little snail that this wonderful gentleman was researching. And, um, you know, it, it can be quite daunting, to be honest, when you've got limited time with somebody to photograph a two millimetre snail that lives underwater. I really felt the pressure with it. So I, I built a little aquarium out of microscope slides. And luckily it was OK. It was it was possible to get some shots of it there in the field. And I use little aquaria made of slides all the time. These are some hydra from my pond. Here we go. Very Heath Robinson. Um, these pictures sort of evolve as we go, but that was how I got the previous shot. Uh, if you have a big enough aquarium, you can photograph the life cycle of a lobster. So <laughs> all sorts of ways of rigging things up to, to get these optical effects that I like using flash. You can get a white background with this very cheap setup you can see here, <laughs> all very temporary. Uh, but that's the image I got from that little scene there, a little glass dish held over a white background, baby lobsters all bobbing about. And then I had to build a setup to show a lobster in a supposed natural habitat in inverted commas. So here we are on an office floor. And this is the image you can get, you know, if you set up the flashes properly, it's all doable. Kind of rainy day photography for me if I can't be outside. So there's a little overview of some of the maybe more local photography I've been doing over the last year. Um, it's been a great time actually to be a natural history photographer. It's been a lot quieter in the countryside around where I am, um, but I am looking forward to things moving on, I must say. This is a sundew that I photographed on the Isle of Mull with Nick some years ago. And these are one of my favorite botanical subjects to work with. They're carnivorous plants. So these little droplets on the end of each leaf stalk are sticky and have digestive enzymes in. So they'll capture insects and the plant will absorb um, nitrogen and other minerals from the insect. And they're just one of those go-to subjects I love working with in Scotland. Um, it's just a bit damper up there and they seem to be there in profusion few other shots from the Isle of Mull. You can see it doesn't matter if it's fungus or a puffin. I like this wide angle idea where you show a subject in its context. You're trying to get close with a wide lens. You can tell so much more about that creature than having a simple blurry out of focus background. Fingal's Cave up on the Isle of Mull. Um, done quite a long exposure here to blur the sea. This is one of the locations, as you may have guessed, that it's possible to travel to with me uh, if that's something that interests you. 
just trying to give you a little flavour of what it's like there. I haven't included any, any pictures of midges in this one, I'll confess. And whilst we're up in, the, in Scotland with this little set of images, these, these chaps, or it's actually a female and a male, these are raft spiders, Dolomedes fimbriatus, and they live in the little moorland pools. And I'm really looking forward to revisiting these, um, well, this year actually, um, because I've got a new macro lens that can be submerged in the water. And I'm just thinking, wow, can I get a shot split level shot at water level looking straight at one of these raft spiders. I suppose, I think it was, um, I don't know how many years ago it was, I started um, running tours with Wildlife Worldwide and um, my friend Nick, but I think we started with um, a trip to Austria and it's somewhere that I really love. I'm I wonder, maybe some of you listening this evening have actually been to Austria with me already, and you'll know my passion for the place. Uh, when you go in June, you've got this wonderful transition phase where the snow's still retreating at the top of the mountains and the flowers are coming out in great carpets, bringing all the insect life out as well. These are Soldanella persilla, um, the alpine snowbell, and they actually melt holes in the snow uh, by fermenting carbohydrates in the bud. It's just incredible to see these coming out on the top of the mountain. Down in the meadows, absolutely glorious conditions for any photographer. Here I am shielding the sun from a subject. Um, to illustrate this, this is the subject in bright sun. Here it is with a shadow over it. So if I hop back, bright sun, and now look at the shaded version. You can actually see a lot more detail in the highlights and shadows. So classically, everybody used to say, oh, let's take pictures on a sunny day. I actually try and turn sunny days into cloudy days very often for what I do. Another wide angle view showing the little primula in its context. Working with insects uh, has its challenges. And I think one of the commonest questions I get is how do you stop them moving? And of course you can't really. I'm, I'm not one to put things in the fridge. Um, I don't work with dead insects. I like to work with happy living insects. It's more about understanding their behavior. So um, if you go out early in the morning, you will see the butterflies roosting, warming up their wings, opening their wings to get sunlight for maybe 10 minutes before flying off. And you, you actually get the best butterfly photos of the day in the space of about 10 minutes. <laughs> and I'm not saying the rest of the day is a write-off by any means, but that's when the real magic happens. Um, so here we're just shooting straight into the sun, all these lovely dew drops around too. It's that frantic time where you're trying to photograph everything around you and you know it's not going to last. This is a crab spider awaiting its next victim. So it's on a, a globe orchid out in Austria. They can change colour um, from yellow to white and back again to match the flower. But if they're on a pink one, they're stuck. <laughs> Stands out like a sore thumb. Right on the mountain tops, uh, we get these lovely trumpet gentian. And it's bizarre because you have a bright blue sky, but when you have that next to a trumpet gentian, you realize the sky actually looks quite desaturated. So intense is the blue of this wonderful mountain flower. If you look down a trumpet gentian right into the middle, sometimes you'll see a little inhabitant. This is another crab spider species. And its strategy is to wait out a visiting pollinator and grab it and eat it. And it also gets some protection from the elements there. If you're interested, I photographed this by firing a flash through the flower, through the side of the flower, made for a very interesting white balance problem to correct. But um, other than that, it worked quite well. I think my, um, my favorite insect in Austria has to be the Apollo, this butterfly, um, creates a sort of mania when it appears and <laughs> quite rightly so it's like nothing we see in England that's for sure 
Uh, he's got slightly translucent wing tips. You can see on the right wing at the top, you can see the lichen showing through there. Um, and if you get the timings right, you can get a mass emergence of these. Some years I've been to Austria and not found any because, you know, that's nature. You, you just can't be sure um, how the seasons are going to treat you. But you get a very good chance of seeing one going in June and getting down underneath one against a stormy sky. You can actually see some raindrops on its wings there as well, like stained glass. I love doing white background photography. This is a scorpion fly. This is done in the field on a piece of white paper. Very simple to do. You can just get an insect on your hand, transfer it to the paper, um, take one shot, off it goes. But it's all about the lighting. So on the right, we've got a diffused flash set up. On the left, we've used a flash without any diffusion. And you can really see the difference there in how the colors render. Well, we've looked at Scotland, uh, we've looked at my back garden indeed, and we've looked at Austria. I'd like to take you to the tropics briefly now. Here I am in Costa Rica in my element, uh, a moth trap, all sorts of things turning up. I do love a moth trap. Um, brilliant thing to try, by the way, at home. I mean, it's a UV light that attracts moths all throughout the evening and night. Um, and you'd be amazed at some of the colours of the species we get in the UK. Now this picture um, surprises some people with the settings I've used, so it's a two second exposure and obviously this requires the use of a tripod and it's it's very simple photography, you know, it's not difficult. You have to approach this, this, this uh, poison frog slowly, but this concept that if you've got a tripod and your subject isn't moving, it doesn't really matter how long the exposure is. Um, and so I always take my tripod with me. I probably wouldn't use it for fast moving butterfly pictures, I have to be honest, but a lot of the other time I would like to use it. Um, it lets me check the focus perfectly. And of course, there's no way I could handhold a shot for two seconds. The colour that you get in rainforests is always so remarkable. You know, we've just looked at a poison frog there. Now we've got these gorgeous macaws. And I, I very often come back from um, trips thinking that, you know, I'm faced with all these little brown and green subjects that I work with under stones in the UK. And I have to look really hard to find these colours sometimes. Um, but it's, it's always a relief when I, I head out to the tropics and you get this sort of rainbow bonanza of life. Chris, I'm, I'm conscious that I could go on all night about various pictures, but I wanted to break out briefly from the slideshow just to show people a few bits of kit um, that I've got here this evening. Um, so. Not that I'm particularly looking for your permission, but I'm just going to stop the screen share now. No, go for it, Alex. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, let's just come out of there. Stop share. Right. Hide again. So, you, you do do your thing. Yeah. So here I am. I just want. I didn't want to run out of time for this bit because it will probably help if we've got some questions at the end to get us thinking about a few things. Um, I wanted to show you firstly how I use a flash gun because it's been so intrinsic to the work so far. So here's my camera with the macro lens on and I've got a diffuser here that I can pull on over the front of any old flash gun really. The idea is that this is a very small surface area for the light to be delivered from if I pop this on, we've now got the option of wrapping light all the way around the subject. And what I'd actually do is I'd, I'd position this off camera flash. If this fist is the subject, literally this close to it so that we get light coming all the way around it to create the sort of soft 
flight that you'd probably associate with a cloudy day on the whole. Um, works really well. There are lots of different diffusers out there, so don't get caught up on a particular brand, but um, as long as you're putting a diffuser on and getting it very close to the subject, um, that will really help your flash photography. This is a radio trigger that I've just plugged onto the top. That allows me to hand hold my flash and I don't have a trailing wire um, getting in the way of things. The wires are fine. So I just think I've got one on my little table here. Um, yeah, these wires are fine. You can you can plug that into the top of your camera and that into the flash. But sometimes you find they're a bit restrictive as you're moving your equipment around. I'll have to show you the ridiculous macro lens, won't I? The, the one I was talking about that I want to use with the raft spiders that's partly waterproof. So it um, looks like it's escaped from a hospital clinic, doesn't it? But um, you can see it's got a tiny little lens right at the end. And it's a probe lens. So it means that I can approach rather skittish insects that would normally be scared away by my presence this tiny little tip of the lens and they tend to tolerate that quite well so i've just been doing some really interesting pictures with uh, tiger beetles for instance that that usually run away that's that's made by i don't know if you can see by lauer uh, they make all sorts of really interesting third-party lenses for canon nikon everyone really um lauer also made this 15 mil macro lens that I used for the slime mold picture earlier. Um, let's see what else we've got. This is my MPE 65 lens that I've, I've been using for all the really close up shots of eggs and such like. And I've recently been playing around with a little CCTV lens that I've managed to use step down rings to mount on the front of it. So much like the probe lens, I now have a really interesting perspective option. I should be able to put a tiny fisheye lens right in a spider's face and hopefully get the world as the spider sees it. Um, still to be tested really. And I think the last thing I'll try and show you here is this little tiny tripod, because I've got a, a nice big tripod I use for a lot of my work, but sometimes space is a real issue when you're getting in close to a subject. And I find that having this minimal setup means I can get really low to the ground. Sometimes I just use it to hold a flash gun, to be honest. Um, but it's, it's a fabulous, concept um having a sturdy tiny tripod like this uh, you can actually use it for telephoto photography as well um, so there you go i'll just finish off with a couple more rainforest slides see if i can work out how to do this again share screen um, there we go cancel that okay right chris can you confirm that we can see a frog chris yeah, most, most definitely alex yes absolutely you can alex. see a frog I can. okay that's good that's very reassuring um okay so we're just hopping ahead a little bit um this is this is in peru and i have used here a little bit of fill flash because the foreground of this shot was very, very dark. And you often find with my work that I'll, I'll use a little tickle, a very gentle tickle of flash in the foreground of a picture to just lift everything. And it's subtle, so you shouldn't really notice it's there, but it's very equivalent to in, if you use Photoshop or Lightroom, using a brush to just lighten the front of the image or the subject, but it's as though you're actually doing it in the field. Um, so you can mix flash with natural light and it can give really useful results. Um, here's the same frog done with a full circular fish eye lens. 
so this is an eight mil fish eye. Uh, I do enjoy the creativity of circular images, but I can tell you they don't tend to publish very well because magazines aren't that shape, unfortunately. Have a look at that caterpillar. This is on a night walk in the rainforest. I do think that's the best time to be out, really. I, I'm completely exhausted when I come back from a rainforest trip because, I mean, there's, there's lovely stuff to see in a day, but then when you'd normally go to bed, you're up all night looking at things like this. Obviously, first thing in the morning, though, the, what you're not getting here is the dawn chorus that I can tell you was spectacular that particular morning. Here's a dragon mantis. Same techniques that I'd use if I was photographing a beech bud in my back garden in Derbyshire. Um, I try and keep my photography quite simple in that I'm using the same settings all the time. So when I photograph an insect up close, I tend to use F16, ISO 100 and a 200th of a second and then light it with flash. That's just what seems to work for me. And and then I kind of don't have to worry about the photography too much when I see a subject like this. It's a, it has to become a bit second nature, like driving, if you know. Um, if you're too bogged down in the, the techniques you're using, you stop thinking about the subject as much um, and about the composition. Here's a horned frog in Borneo. I hope you spotted it. I don't know how to do laser pointers in Zoom, so I can't point it out to you, <laughs> but I can assure you it's there. Another scene from a night walk in Borneo, looking underneath a leaf this time. These are little stink bugs, bright red coloration to warn everybody that they're not tasting very nice there. And you can see one egg is yet to emerge in this little group. Now, I'm sorry that I did take all the tarantulas out of this talk because I, I know some people are a bit iffy about them. And I sort of forgot about this large huntsman spider. So apologies if you're not too keen on spiders. Anyway, you can see wonderful details in all the hairs there. That's focus stacked from about eight images. And we're just going to finish off with a little bit of ultraviolet photography. So if I shine an ultraviolet torch into this scene we can see a scorpion appears so their carapace fluoresces under ultraviolet light um, it's really good fun to try and in fact if you go out at night with an ultraviolet torch you see all sorts of things glowing in the rainforest and i'll just finish with um, this reminder that larger subjects are available with me i i don't ignore orangutans i promise um, it's just that my work has proportional representation and there simply are more insects than orangutans in a rainforest. And, and I try and represent that in my photography. But of course, I'm interested in all of nature, for, uh, whole, the whole ecosystem, really, the habitat things live in, how it all connects. Um, and really, photography for me is just a, a tool to better understand the natural world. I'm, I'm sure that resonates with a lot of you you know you you take all these lovely pictures when you visit these places and some of the real fun comes when you get back home and you, you try and work out what it is you've captured and you put all that effort in to identifying them and learning a little bit more about the world okay well that's the end of the picture bit um chris i don't know if you've got a sort of formula for us now do you have a formula? Well, sort of a formula, Alex. Um, That's quite advanced for us. <laughs> um, uh, hey, look, um, that was absolutely fantastic. Thank you so much. That was just brilliant. I, I, I'm always amazed at um, uh, how creative um, it's possible to be with, um, with macro. Uh, and I'm not talking about me in this case. Um, because I lack all creativity um, in photography, uh, particularly in macro photography. But anyway, I, I, absolutely brilliant. And I'm just going to read you uh, uh, two comments that have come in on chat. One um, from Moira, who says, absolutely superb presentation. Thank you. 
Um, and from John, who says, enthralling talk, Alex, inspiring in every way. There you go. Oh, well, thank you, Moira and John. That's very you kind of you to say. You'll be able to get out of your study or um, anyway, but because uh, you'll, you'll, you'll be, uh, anyway, look, um, I've got, I'm, I'm going to start with a, um, with a fairly general question, um, which was posed, and then maybe I'll get a bit more detailed. How about that? But um, uh, Debbie asked right early on, um, in your presentation, uh, not something particularly about photography, but actually about you um, and how you got into photography in the first instance, and more particularly, how you got into macro photography. And I thought that might be quite, quite a good mm. thing to start this. Yeah, well, thanks for that question, Debbie. Um, you know, there are days I ask myself that, <laughs> having a long look in the mirror. Um, I suppose, in some senses, I've, I've never really grown up. I mean, when I was a little boy, my my first words were words for insects in the garden. Um, and I think we've all got that, haven't we? I mean, you put any child uh, next to a woodlouse, for instance, and they're, they're going to be fascinated by it. And it it's almost like it gets conditioned out of us as we, as we grow up, I think, um, just the way the world is these days. But I always say to people when we're out in the field, we've got to all become kids again. You know, that that's our aim and that's how we're going to get all these insights into the world, all these photos. So for me, I sort of felt like it was maybe always there. Um, but on a practical level, I, I suppose I got a camera quite early on and I did a master's in biological photography and imaging at Nottingham University and set up my business I think it was in 2007 and I actually you know quite frankly just to make ends meet the ratio of private tuition I did on say Lightroom and things at the beginning was much greater so I, you know helped a lot of people with their computer editing and stuff and I had some time to do the insect photography on the side and that that ratio has sort of balanced out a bit more now and I'm I'm lucky enough that I can do commissions that you know maybe span a whole year on and off um, working with very specialist small subjects and you know you kind of you've got to approach it as a niche you know if if you specialize enough eventually there just isn't that much competition in that particular area um, so I found actually that rather than being really competitive, it's, you know, there's actually a reasonable amount of work for me now, um, doing very close up photography. Um, but yeah, I mean, if anybody's interested in pursuing things professionally with photography, I'd say the best thing you can do is learn everything you can about nature. <laughs> um, it's it didn't take too long then. Well, no, but you know, when, when I get asked by a child, how can I be a wildlife photographer? And I look, I look up from their shoulder to their long suffering parents thinking, Oh God, can't they just get a real job? You know, <laughs> I, I had him lined up for a promising career in the city and now he's going to be a wildlife photographer. I think, well, you don't want to sort of break people's hearts and say, Oh, it's, it's really difficult. Um, so I always think most of what I do is actually researching, learning about, and exploring nature and the bit with the camera kind of comes in right at the end you know I've put all that research into going somewhere um, and being there at the right time of the year all those sort of things and that's based on knowledge that I've been building up since I was a kid so that's that's what I always say to the kids sorry you've it's like you're an agony aunt for me now you've opened up all of my insecurities <laughs> by asking that question at the beginning <laughs> you need a lighter question than that next okay I'll, I'll give you well less it, soul searching depends on your perspective um <laughs> so so um i've got so many questions um so one one particularly pertinent question i thought um which was asked right back at the beginning mm. um which was asked by trevor uh, and and he has posed a very interesting question, um, which 
a lot of people will know the answer to, but a lot of people won't. And it's this, it's a, it's the simplest question ever, which is what is a macro lens? Because of course oh. we're talking about macro lenses all the time. And by definition, therefore, how does it differ from other lenses? I think Brilliant question. question. And I mean, I think if I if I had a sort of plan for my talk this evening, I might well have covered that. But there we go. Um, <laughs> I'm glad you asked. Everything, Alex. So a macro lens gives what's known as <laughs> yeah, a macro lens gives what's known as one to one magnification. So the sensor on a full frame camera is nominally 35 millimeters um across and it relates to 35 mil slide film i suppose it's a sort of standard that's been adopted by photography and a one-to-one -one macro lens will render a 35 mil subject filling that sensor so you can you can fill the frame with a 35 millimeter beetle that is one-to-one -one macro and really anything that's less than that in terms of magnification isn't technically a true macro lens but it's a very loose term these days so you know a mobile phone will say it has a macro feature it's not using that exact standard of you know filling the frame with a 35 mil subject um, anymore so really now we're talking about macro being any lens that lets you get very close and by getting close, you, of course, get more magnification. So this macro lens here, I mean, if I turn the focusing scale, it's got a sort of scale in meters from infinity that goes all the way down to 30 centimeters. So that will mean that if I just get my other camera, that would be 30 centimeters from the subject, from the sensor plane to the subject, not from the front of the lens to the subject, from the sensor plane to the subject. So it'll be like, you can get about that close. Yeah. And obviously a telephoto lens, you'd probably be like two meters away, minimum focusing distance. So that's how they achieve uh, magnification. Did I answer the question, Chris? I can't remember what it was now. <laughs> it was, what is a macro lens, which you, uh, which you very eloquently answered, yes. Oh, good. I, th I felt I'd got there, but I didn't want to accidentally start talking about something else. No, no, marvellous. You did it brilliantly. Um, good. I don't think they noticed. So, so then moving on from that, um, Alan has asked whether, in your view, for someone who's getting started in macro photography, is it better to start with a dedicated macro lens or to use a wide angle lens with a macro setting? Hmm, I think you'd be best off using a dedicated macro lens to begin with, because the wide angle close up shots I showed you quite a few of this evening are actually, whilst they're visually the most interesting, I think, quite hard to do. I don't just mean technically, but I mean, there aren't that many situations you find day to day where that looks really good, because, of course, you've not only got to consider your subject, but you've got to consider the whole microcosm around it. So there was that picture I showed you, that green and black frog in Peru. That area of rainforest behind that frog was critical to that picture working. And quite frankly, if I was to go out and try and photograph everything I saw that was little and interesting in that way, I would end up with an awful lot of pictures with a lot of superfluous kind of extra bits of background that I probably wouldn't want. Um, so I would say, yeah, that's more like for special occasions, really. And most of the time, you'd probably want a dedicated macro lens. Um, but the good news is there's quite a range of lenses out there these days. Um, Tamron make a very good quality 90 mil macro now that's I know a lot of people like because it it's a bit more affordable. I've got obviously the Canon 100 mil macro. Um, 100 millimeters, by the way, is a really nice focal length for a macro lens. It means that when you're close focused on that subject, as I said, it's 30 centimeters there or thereabouts from the sensor to the subject. That means that I can be taking a picture and I can reach in with my hand 
and say there's a beetle running around, I might be able to encourage it to walk back towards the, the lens or if there's a blade of grass, I can move it. If I have a 180 mil macro lens, everything's a bit further away. You're getting the same magnification, but you're kind of at arm's length just about interacting with that scene. And I find that a bit more clumsy. Similarly, if you get a 50 mil macro lens, you're now a lot closer to the subject to the extent that you'll probably scare the insect you're trying to photograph or at the very least cast a shadow on it so um just thought i'd drop that in there i really like 100 mil thereabouts um for my day-to-day -day macro shots now you talk about scaring um insects but sarah has posed the question where she says with frogs for example if you use flash haven't you really only got one shot as it would effectively frighten the animal? Um, I mean, there certainly have been occasions where not just with frogs, but with butterflies, lots of things where not even setting off the flash, sometimes just me being... turning the focus ring, it would disappear. But I do find that, uh, yeah, like the... The more confiding animals will sit there and a lot of things will tolerate flash um but a little bit on the welfare side of things because you know you do have to put the welfare of your subject above everything yeah. else and as a tour leader you can imagine the sort of refereeing i have to do in my head if we find something spectacular but i think it, it should only maybe have five pictures taken of it before we leave it alone, but the group size is 12. You've got to be very clear before you go out that night as to how we're going to approach things, you know, to keep yeah. people happy, but more importantly, the subjects happy. So I think with, with a lot of frogs, you could actually take quite a few flash pictures of them without them jumping off. Um, you know, for a start, they'll have seen your head torch as yeah. you approach them because most of these are nocturnal things um what i tend to do to reduce the impact i'm having on them is i put my camera on a high iso like iso 1600 and then that allows me to use a much weaker pulse of light from the flash and to be honest the noise capabilities of the cameras these days are so excellent that you can't really tell the difference between that and iso 100 as long as you've got the exposure right um but yeah i mean there's i remember um sorry i've just found something horrible i've just found a cracker with marmite on it stuck face down on the cushion i'm sitting on and one of the children that's really horrible and it's a shame because it's a william morris design cushion as well never mind <laughs> It's never mind. Never a dull moment with you. <laughs> well, luckily it's highly patterned, so it probably won't notice too much. Um, <laughs> anyway, where was I? Um, oh. Yeah, I, I remember that I was once photographing some lemurs in Madagascar and they were silhouetted above the canopy or behind the canopy and because I was sort of looking up towards the sky. And these were some lemurs that were you know sort of coming and investigating the camp we were staying in they were very habituated to people so for instance when you washed they'd sort of try and drink the water from underneath your feet whilst you were washing i mean it was it was it made for some really interesting photographic opportunities and i was trying to use a bit of fill flash to lift them out of the silhouette um against the sky and every single picture I took of them had a lemur with its eyes closed. And I thought, <laughs> God, how's it doing that? I mean, because the flash is sort of instant, but it seemed like it was closing its eyes every time the flash went off. And it turns out it was because my flash was in TTL mode. So your flash has a manual mode and a TTL mode. Yeah. If you're in TTL mode, which stands for through the lens, as in through the lens metering, it's a, an automatic mode. And the flash tries to work out how much light you need um, automatically without you really having to do anything. In manual, it's completely up to you how much light comes out of that flash. So um, you, you kind of get used to how much you need. Anyway, on TTL mode, what actually happens is when you press the shutter, 
it does a very quick pre-flash to kind of mm. gauge how much light it needs for the main flash. And the lemurs were reacting to that initial pre-flash, giving them just enough time to close their eyes for the main picture. So I just thought I'd mention it because if you see animals with their eyes closed when you've used a flash, it might be better to right. try manual mode instead. That is very good, thank you. And that <laughs> I would um, uh, I would I would describe as being an, a settings issue. And one or two people, including Mark, has said has has requested that you possibly repeat um, the base settings that you use for your macro setup. Ah, yes. Well, Mark, I'd be very happy to, because um, I realise in full flow when I start rabbiting on about oh f16 this that and the other you kind of like a chance to write it down maybe so if i was to take a photo with a flash of an insect in in the normal way i do it so that is holding the camera in one hand and the flash in the other kind of like this just next to the insect <clears throat> my camera would be on manual mode so not aperture priority it'd be on manual mode i would be on iso 100 f16 or maybe f11 but something that gives good depth of field and 160th or a 200th of a second so what we call the sync speed of the camera and this is the fastest shutter speed you can use a flash with under normal conditions now, the key to this is that if I have ISO 100 F16 and a 200th of a second, unless I'm in the middle of the Sahara Desert, the picture is going to come out black with the available sunlight. And that's really important because it means that I'm not recording any ambient light in that scene, whether it's day or night. Which then means all the light comes from your flash. So you're effectively painting light into that black canvas with your flash gun which I also have in manual mode. And all I do is turn it up and down until I have the right amount of light. And I often get it wrong. So I'll take an initial picture and it'll be too dark and it'll say have been on a quarter power. And I will then change the flash to a half power. And miraculously, that will be right. Um, and once I've set that up, so my camera's staying on manual mode, my flash on manual mode, of course, it's the same for every situation I find then. So if you're going on a night walk in the rainforest, you can then pretty much relax about camera settings from there on and just enjoy seeing things and photographing them. Um, now, what I've told you there is one of the recipes I use for macro photography. That is like how I do flash photography, really. I don't want you to go away from this evening thinking that I never use natural light and that I'm allergic to it in some way, because that's not the case. So it's actually, for me, much more enjoyable to just work with what nature gives us. I, I love, say, being in a meadow and seeing the backlighting and the little drops lighting up and everything. Um, so when conditions are right, yeah, I, I love avoiding flash. And in those situations, I would probably do something a bit more recognizable to most people and I'd be an aperture priority in my camera. And I would be, if I was hand holding, wary of letting the shutter speed get too low, really. So, you know, you don't really want to get below a 200th of a second most of the time, or I might see some handshake. Um, but, you know, th there's the two scenarios I commonly use. That is absolutely brilliant. Thank you. Um, so then we've had, um, I won't, I'll only ask you a couple more questions. That's fine. I'm, I'm not going anywhere. <laughs> you not, might be. Surprisingly enough. <laughs> well, I am getting a bit peckish, but that's another matter. Yeah, no, I know what you mean. Um, I have this cracker. But um, one or two people have asked questions about focus stacking. Mm. Um, so first question, I'll ask you all three questions and um, you can amalgamate your answer. The first question is from Dave, um, who says, were you going to explain how to do focus stacking? The second question from John, who says, um, is 
stitching stacked images only possible if you shoot in RAW and use Lightroom to get your final image. And the third question is from June, who says, is there a Canon camera that has in-camera photo stacking? I'm sorry, that's a bit of a, that's kind of three, I walloped you with three things. That's all right. Um, like, like being hit around the face with a wet fish. But there we go, all three stacking questions in one. Yeah, um, so effectively focus stacking works by combining two or more images of a scene where you've moved in a Z axis rather than the X and Y axis. So you've moved towards or away from the subject. Um, there are a number of ways of doing it. And I, I like to, I like to just use the manual focus on my camera. Um, for focus stacking. So I've switched my macro lens to manual focus. Now you probably can't see the switch, but anyway, one of those switches on the side. And the simplest way of doing it would be to combine two, two shots. Um, you're on a tripod. You've used live view on the back of the camera to focus on the closest element of that subject. And you take a picture and then all you do is just turn the manual focus a tiny bit and take a second picture. And that's the camera bit over and done with. Um, and if you've shot both those images at f16, that's actually a lot of depth of field you're going to get in that picture. Um, so I often, after I've taken a photo of something, then take a second and a third image, just moving the focus a little bit more into the background in case I want to turn it into a focus stack later. They're almost like insurance focus stack shots. You know, I might use them, I might not. Um, and most people can relate to that technique, you know, that manual focus, just move through the scene. Critically, move the focus as little as possible. And this is why my three-year-old can manage it, because <laughs> it's not really about composition or skill. It's just about following some basic instructions really you've got to pretend you're a robot scanning this subject from front to back you don't look through the viewfinder and think oh i like the head but oh i really like the antennae over there and oh i like those wings i'll have some of that and some of that you've got to be very methodical just start at the front and step back into the subject and the smaller you make those movements with the focusing ring the more likely it is you'll have lots of overlap between the individual frames and that the software will be able to stitch your image properly. The problems come when you move that focusing ring too much and it jumps too great a distance in one go. And you might not even have any overlap at all. Because of course, when you're really close to a subject, you have very little depth of field at whatever aperture you choose. And, you know, it's very easy um, to miss out a critical section of that image. The other way that I go about focus stacking is to just hand hold it on a shutter burst, believe it or not. So I put it on high speed shutter burst, and this would be if I was hand holding on aperture priority in the field. And I'd lock onto a subject, and I'll just see if I can demonstrate this now. So I'd say that a butterfly has just landed in front of me on a flower. I'd auto focus on the front of it and then hold down the shutter button and rotate the manual focus through the subject. And in that way, I might get three or four shots of it before it's moved and can no longer be sequenced in that way. So I think that's, um, that's probably you know, a bit more of a cowboy approach to it. But I'll be honest, it works. So as long as your shutter speed is really fast, like a thousandth of a second, you can get away with that. Um, but significantly then, though, Alex, sorry to interrupt you. Yeah. Then what you need to do is, as, as um, John, John has um, uh, uh, proposed in, in his question, those images need to be combined within. Ah, oh, sorry. Yes. Right? 
So, well, well done, Chris. Well done. I see you've spotted the glaring and deliberate uh, omission there. So you then need to use Lightroom. In well, yeah. Or I, on such software. Okay, Lightroom does not do focus stacking. Okay. Photoshop does focus, focus stacking, as do many other programs. So I use something called Helicon Focus. Helicon Focus. Um, there's Zareen Stacker as well. Quite a few options out there. Um, Helicon Focus is you can just drag a big heap of images onto the standalone application. And all you do is press a play button and it will squirt out a finished image. It's as simple as that. Um, and I mean, as I keep saying, my three year old can do this. So um, have faith, you know, you can, all, you can all manage it. I certainly hope you can. Um, <laughs> but the other way of doing it is in Photoshop where you can select your images in Lightroom and batch process them exactly the same so that all the shadows, highlights, white balance is all the same on every single image. And then you can open them as layers straight into Photoshop. And within Photoshop, there is a focus stacking feature, but you need to create a stack of layers first to do that. It sounds as though Helicon Focus is a rather simpler, simpler. Uh, it, it is, it's simpler. It, there are, I actually use both things. Um, Photoshop works better for the quick and dirty handheld cowboy stacks, you know, mm -hmm. where I'm just rattling off some frames and things are moving around and it's not sort of clinically executed. Helicon Focus doesn't like that because it uses some really clever formulae to kind of map the images together over a, a sort of presupposed 3D surface and if, if there's too much variation it just doesn't know what to do but if your technique's really good Helicon will give you superior images and uh, you know by good I just mean you've used a tripod really. So, <laughs> it's, so, it's not so look um, a couple of people asked um, since you mentioned tripod a couple of people asked who makes that very small tripod that you ah created. yeah um it's made by really right stuff rrs yeah and that they you know they they make my big tripod in fact i'll just get it because it's got a focus stacking head on it as well um just bear with me so you see quite a lot of really right stuff appearing on our trips these days, don't you, Chris? It's a, um, yes, especially like, travelling with you and Nick. Yeah, I, I, I'm not on commission, by the way. I should be, but I'm not. Um, I'm sure Nick is, or if he isn't, he should be. I think there may be an arrangement there, but I'm not party to it. Um, so this is the ball head I use as standard. And when I'm focus stacking, I'll attach this macro rail. Okay. So that- Is there a particular macro rail that you recommend? <laughs> hey, did you know really right stuff make a macro rail, Chris? Um, <laughs> might, just a seriously, little. that's one option. Uh, NovaFlex make a very good macro rail too. And I would say with macro rails, don't go too cheap because this is about moving the camera less than a millimetre at a time. And you can imagine if it's a wobbly setup, that's just not going to be possible. You no. know, you've got to be really precise with this stuff. So anyway, I've locked the camera down like that and I can easily mount it on top of the macro rail. And what I'm now able to do is rotate this knob at the back and the camera's moving about half a millimetre on a full rotation. Wow. Okay. Yeah. And there's a clutch on it as well. So I can kind of slide the whole camera forwards and backs yep. if I want, which is very useful for composition. Yeah. So you might have set up your tripod and not really want to move it, but you need to be a bit closer. So it, it comes out with me all the time, the macro rail, really. 
Um, um, just on on the on the subject of images going into uh, into software um, programs, Helicon, yeah. for example, or or Photoshop. Um, can can you do that with raw images and JPEGs? Yeah, I'm um, better to do it with raw, presumably. Yeah, you can do it with raw. Um, Helicon Focus allows you to ingest DNG raw files so that you can keep all of that dynamic range you'd expect from a raw but file. You can do it with JPEGs as well? JPEGs are just fine, honestly. Really? Um, a perfectly exposed JPEG. Yeah. If something's well exposed, you're not really going to notice the difference so long as your camera's. JPEG sharpening settings aren't too silly. So that's something you have to watch. If you shoot in JPEG, the camera might apply some sharpening in camera, which can make things look a bit crunchy. And with focus stacking, it can really confuse matters because if you sharpen the files in camera, it can make out of focus things look slightly sharp. And then the software thinks it actually is sharp and tries to stitch together what are basically artifacts from the digital sharpening. So if you want to do focus stacking from JPEGs, it's fine, but just make sure you've turned sharpening to zero in camera. Um, because it's it's basically like the camera's applying a little bit of Photoshop there in camera to just make everything look a bit more crispy and you know, sharp yeah. edged, but it's it's artificial. Um but yeah, JPEGs so, are fine. So um, the one, being a Canon cameraman, um, there are one or two people, um, June particularly has asked whether there are any Canon cameras that have in-camera focus stacking. Well, I think, you know, we've, what we've realized now is that cameras like my one here, this digital SLR, are, almost older generation now uh, i haven't made the leap to mirrorless yet but there are a number of cameras out there now that offer focus stacking in camera yeah. and as in they will actually assemble the finished image for you in camera i personally prefer it if they do the focus bracketing automatically so they effectively take over the autofocus motor for the lens and go yeah. chunk, 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 and move it by tiny degrees so you're not having to manually turn it yeah. and you know certainly the canon r5 and r6 have i think the r6 definitely the r5 have this um focus bracketing option where you could choose to have all of those files to then play with yourself and stitch yeah the reason is that like it is great if something stitches it in camera if you just want to see it there and then but i can guarantee if you go into a hundred percent view on it on a lot of images there will be bits where the stacking has created some sort of halos or yeah you know maybe i don't know the beetle moved its antenna briefly and there's a sort of double image there yeah so the real world view on it i suppose is you want those original files to be able to play with later um because actually say i made helicon focus sound really simple you put it in and press play the reality is you can actually change some of the parameters and um you know if you've got blurry bits or halos you can move it from four to six on the radius and such like and have another go at it and often eliminate those problems so sure yeah there are options to do it all in camera but um for me my next camera will be the canon r5 and rather than having it all stitched in camera i'd probably just opt to use its focus bracketing alone um to create that sequence very simply and then i will play with those images myself is that okay? Great skills. <laughs> um, hey, Alex, uh, thank you so much. That's absolutely brilliant. Really wonderful. Um, I'm going to ask you one final question, which was actually the very first question that we had. Um, yeah. And that um, is from Linda, who's asked whether that's a bone on the wall behind your head. Oh, um, fancy you noticing that. Well, <laughs> I, I collect, I collect. Um, ice age bones um, that are bycatch from trawlers in the North Sea. 
so when they trawl up fish, sometimes they catch something a bit bigger. Uh, so we've got a number of mammoth bones in the house, and this is a thoracic vertebra. So let's just get it down. And it's got a wonderful spinal process on it, as I'm sure you'll agree. Um, and all of the back muscles and shoulder muscles of the mammoth were attached to this. So this allowed it to lift its enormous head and tusks up. Um, yeah, it would look much the same if you saw a modern day elephant thoracic vertebra. But um, there you go, just one of my little weaknesses. <laughs> mammoth um, bones. Alex. Uh, if you're interested, northseafossils.com. That's where to get them, is it? You there, Chris? I'm still here, yes. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, northseafossils.com. Yeah, it just, it sounded, you know, a little bit um, breaky up here. It's, it's fine again now. Um, Alex, thank you. That was absolutely superb. Can I trouble you to um, to put that slide on, which has got um, the one... Yeah, I'll see if it's there. Hang on a minute. Um, no, I, I just load it up from the desktop, Chris. It's probably okay. easier. Okay. Because we... Um... It's a reminder Chris... to me... What... Yeah, I tell you, Chris sent me a slide to add to this slideshow. When was it? Was it with two minutes to go? You're not supposed to tell the good people all those things like that. There you go. Um, hang on. And it needs to go on screen share. So I need to just, just a minute. I just need to close this. I tried to give the impression that I'm extraordinarily well organised. and that well, you, you, you are, Chris. You are. Of course, we all value you for that. But... Um, let me just cut to it. Is that showing it? No. Oh, hang on. No, is this showing it? That's the one. It doesn't That's look it. very big yet, but um, there it is. That's good. Can um, you see that? I can see that. Thank you. And everyone else can as well. Because um, I need to remind people that we've got, because it's Wednesday today, you see, I'm all out of sync. Um, it's Wednesday and it's, and it's a bit later than usual, but that tomorrow we've got um, Discover Columbia. Oh. Um, and... Uh, that's tomorrow on and of course typically I didn't put the day on the Finland's boreal predators the in-depth talk that's a lunchtime talk but that's on Friday um, and on, on Tuesday we've got Discover Borneo um, so I do hope that um, some people that are on board this evening will be tuned into some of those um, some of those talks and presentations um, Alex, I am going to conclude with um, one or two comments that people have made, which I'm sure others will be delighted to hear, and I am delighted to um, uh, and delighted to uh, chuck out into the great wide world. Um, from Jason, thanks, Alex, for sharing your tech thoughts and experience. As ever, fantastic pictures and insightful presentation. Um, fantastic, thank you. That's from Jeanette. Excellent presentation. That's from June. Janet says it's been brilliant. Good grief. You're not, you are really are not going to get out of your study. Um, Andy says, brilliant talk, very inspirational, lots of useful information and great photos. And I'm going to read you one um, that came right at the very beginning, if I can find it, because um, I've forgotten who it was from now. Anyway, it, it, I, can't, I can't find it either. But broadly speaking, it said something like, um, I was lost right at the beginning, but now I've got it. That was that was that, oh, that good. The, the, uh, oh, that's nice. The comment which I which I thought was lovely. Oh, here we go. Yeah. I've got another one here. What a superb and inspirational presentation! I've recently bought a macro lens, so it's given me loads of ideas and food for thought. Oh, but that's really nice. Uh, thank you. Uh, you're a very kind audience. Um, thank you, Chris, for selecting only the positive comments to read out. <laughs> yeah, I was reading the others. Um, <laughs> thanks for vetting those. Um, no, it's brilliant. Yeah. Thank you so much. Um, and, and to all those, um, to all those people out there, I, I have travelled with before. Um, I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing you again at some point. And I, I hope if, if maybe we haven't yet met, um, there'd be a chance to see you in the field sometime. Um, it's, it's always really good fun to be out there just exploring nature, being a kid again, as I said in the talk, that's what it's all about with me. And um, obviously, if you've known Nick Garber, he's a very sensible man. So um, there's a bit of balance there too. There is a bit of balance. Childlike ways. Um, 
Um, no, I'll, I'll hopefully, Chris, I'll, I've, I think I've got a few more talks up my sleeve, so we might make a thing of this. Um, well, it sounds wonderful. Uh, and, and, I, and I can say to, to, to those that remain on board um, that, uh, that travelling with Alex um, is enormous fun and travelling with Alex and Nick is um, double the uh, enormous fun. Um, we've done it once or twice, as I said, right at the beginning, and it's been, it's been great. Um, hey, Alex, I'm going to end it there. Thank you so much. That's been absolutely superb. And uh, we'll see you again very soon, I hope. Thank you. Night-night, everybody. Cheers.